The Bible reading today is Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 to 20. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart, with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you've been banished to the most distant lands under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and all your soul and live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who hate and persecute you. You will again obey the Lord and follow all his commands I am giving to you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb the young of your livestock and the crops of your land, the Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and decrees, they are written in this book of the law and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now that I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you to be on your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth, in your heart, so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient and if you are drawn away to bow down to the other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I give, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice, hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Heavenly Father, we just come to you now and we thank you that we can gather, and we thank you that we can sing, and as we sing out loud, we encourage one another. So thank you for that, Lord. Just help us now to, uh, as we reflect on your word, we thank you for your spirit's presence here, as your word says, and we invite you to do your work of dividing between joint and marrow, as your word does, through your spirit of illuminating that word into us, of bringing conviction, rebuke, encouragement, teaching, that we might, as the body of Christ, be built up together. Amen. Why do we make bad choices when we know what is good? We make all sorts of bad choices despite what we know. We make bad choices when we react instead of considering what someone has said to us. We make bad choices in our driving, which can be very costly in several ways. And just a bit of a tip, if you're going to Sydney, just remember that unlike Cessnock, every intersection, every traffic light, every stop sign, every give way sign, every bend has a camera there. So uh, you will get found out if you make that bad choice. We can make bad choices about our diet. 
we might think to ourselves, well, it's you know, it's been a while since that last bucket of KFC. <laughs> But I suppose it all depends on what your while is, whether that's a few hours, a few days, or a few months. We can make bad choices about exercise. We can make bad choices about our spending. We can make bad choices about what we put in front of our eyes and therefore into our brains, can't we? And if it's not the content, that could be how long we sit there looking at it. Despite knowing the damage that it can do to us, due to our relationships with others, and even our relationship with God. We can make bad choices about our use of time. It's not that we're too busy, it's just that we have wrong priorities a lot of the time. And sometimes that bad choice could be the fact that we just don't make the choice that we know we should. We make bad choices in how we treat God, despite knowing how much he loves us and all that he has done for us and the good that he wants for us, as we read today, the life he wants to give us. We like to think that we're rational beings who make our choices based on the information before us. But study after study proves the opposite. We are irrational beings who make choices on how we're feeling in that moment of decision. We all know that choices have consequences. Getting a significant choice wrong can have a significant consequence. But often it's the small choices every day. It's the habits that over time, all these little choices build up and they tend to have the most consequences for good or bad. The choices we make today, big and small, create our tomorrow for better or worse. In this passage, God is speaking through Moses and he's confronting Israel with choice. To choose to return to the Lord or not. To choose obedience, life and blessing or disobedience, defeat and death. What Moses is saying here is not a slight change of five degrees. It's not a, uh, a new resolution, turning over a new leaf. <laughs> no, this is a 180 degree change he's talking about. This is black and white. This is life and death he's putting before the people of Israel. And so it's a very important passage for us to reflect on. In chapters 28 and 29, Moses was again declaring to the assembled people there on the plains of Moab the theme of Deuteronomy, which we all know by now, don't we? The blessings of obedience and the curses that come from disobedience. In fact, in those chapters leading up to 30, Moses paints a pretty grim picture of Israel rejecting the Lord, their God, who brought them out of slavery, out of Egypt, sustained them for 40 years in the desert. And he says that what they're going to do is that they'll worship other gods and as a consequence, they'll be uprooted from the land of promise and they'll be sent into exile, into a foreign land. But disobedience, God's consequence of righteous judgment and destruction don't have to be the end of the story if they choose God and turn back there can be a very different outcome. 
because we see here that he will have compassion on them and that he will restore them. As we read there in those first four verses, when all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you and you take them to heart, that is effectively when you come to your senses, when you realize that, Wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return, they turn back and repent to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes some Bible say, will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. What an enormously gracious offer the Lord is making here, is he not? To, to this people that have been so rebellious and disobedient. As I reflected on these verses, do you see how these verses contain the very essentials of the gospel there, don't they? The essence there, like the prodigal son. When you come to your senses, when you acknowledge God as your Lord and King, when you repent by turning away from your past and turning to him, he will embrace you. He will restore you. In Israel's case, even if they broke the covenant they made with the Lord and experienced God's judgment, he would still be faithful to that covenant if they choose to return in obedience, in repentance. And we see he will bring you back to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. Some see this to refer to Israel's return to the land after their defeat by Babylon in 586 BC and then 70 years of captivity in, in exile. Then they returned. Some see it as referring to the re-establishment of the nation of Israel in 1948. Others see it in more spiritual terms, and perhaps it could be all of them actually. Especially in light of verse 6, the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Moses then repeats the many blessings that they will receive when they choose to obey the Lord and follow all his commands. I'm giving you today, says in verses 8 and 9. And we see there that the work of your hands will prosper, and so will their wombs, their livestock, and their crops will bear much fruit. See the clear connection here between their wholehearted choice to obey and the personal, the economic, and the environmental blessings that come with that. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as he delighted in your ancestors. All this blessing, if they choose, verse 10, to obey the Lord and keep his commands and decrees with all their heart and soul. In verses 11 to 14, we see that choosing to obey God's commands is not too difficult for them. It's not beyond their reach. 
It's not a mystery that they have to search for up in heaven or travel beyond the sea to find. No, it's there right in front of them. It says, no, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It's in your heart. So you may obey it. The word is what they have been hearing from Moses for the last 30 chapters. It's what their parents heard on Mount Sinai before that. And I'm sure it's in their mouth as they're discussing what Moses is saying to them. And I'm sure it's in their heart as they're discussing, they're agreeing with it. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's good if we do that. That'll be a a good thing to do. At the time that Moses is saying that to them, that's how near it was to them. But will they choose to let the knowledge of God's word change them? And that's the important question we all need to answer through every era, multiple times, every day, do we not? Will I choose to let what I know, my knowledge of God's word and his will for me, change me or not? You see, it's crystal clear how much is at stake here for Israel. Verse 15, see, I set before you today life, and prosperity, or death and destruction. Verse 19, this day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against what you, against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. Five times Moses speaks there about this choice producing life. He's passionately challenging the people standing there that day to choose. To choose life, to choose prosperity, to choose blessing, to choose that things will go well with their children's life, to hold fast to him, or death, destruction, and curses. It's a clear and obvious choice. And Moses' challenge to choose life wasn't just for those people there on the plains of Moab that day. It rings through the centuries, that choice. We know Joshua replaced Moses to lead Israel into the promised land where they were tempted by all the pagan gods that surrounded them, by the peoples that they were going into. And Joshua repeats the same challenge that Moses offered. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, the gods of Egypt or the gods of these people around you or the Lord your God. He said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But this challenge of who you will choose, continues. It continues throughout the Old Testament, in the prophets and the Psalms. Jesus offered the challenge, who will you choose? It's throughout the New Testament. God's people in every era always stand at that moment of choosing life and receiving blessing or death. 
Verse 20. Will we love God? Will we choose to listen to his voice? Will we choose to hold fast to him? Will we choose God or our culture? Will we choose his kingdom and put our shoulder to the wheel so that the gospel might go out, that people can be discipled and transformed, making a difference for eternity? Or will we get distracted and seduced by lesser things and opt out of that race? The problem we have is not a lack of knowledge, is it? The deep, deep problem we have is the old, old problem that we believe the relentless lies that pleasure, satisfaction, security and blessing, that we find all these things outside of what we know is God's will for us. And that problem, that tension we all feel is as old as the Garden of Eden. (laughs) It's as old as the people standing here in the plains of Moab. And yet it's hard when we are constantly bombarded. Bombarded by the lies of our culture in regard to relationships, in regard to sexuality, in regard to gender and mental health and so many other things. And the slogans, we constantly hear these irrational things, though popular, that promote it all the time. You know, you do you, your own personal truth, whatever makes you happy. All these ridiculous Disney slogans constantly bombard us. But the thing is, you don't find a good life. You don't find salvation in your heart. You don't find it by following your dreams. If that stuff all worked, by all the metrics of our sick society would not be going through the roof and getting worse. Secular humanism has failed. Absolutely. The things that attract us don't actually work. And yet our society refuses to join the dots and see the consequences. In contrast to that, the gospel, the good news of forgiveness, grace, transformation, purpose and life that Jesus and his kingdom offers has never looked so good. But here's the thing, I think the freedom and also the irony of the gospel is this, and the contrast to the world is that it's not about you. It's not about you, despite everything the world tells us. It's all about Jesus and his willing sacrifice. That is the thing that changes us when we grasp that. That is the thing that brings blessing. With so much at stake then, we need to think pretty carefully, what is going to help us Choose God, choose obedience, choose life. Here are some ways, I think, that can help us choose well in the longer and the short term, say. The first thing to do is choose to get a notebook. I I don't know, I'm using more and more paper, paper diaries, paper things, paper to prepare sermons, paper, and I actually find it it's working better um, for lots of reasons. Get your notebook and then ask, it's good to ask ourselves, what choices does the Lord want me to make for him? Think in terms of do. 
and don't do. So what positive choices can I make that I can do to grow? I mean, the range is pretty huge, isn't it? It, it could be, for example, well, it would really help me to be a better listener. It could be making time with the Lord each day. It could be, I want to grow in being a better husband or wife. It could be, I know I'll grow if I read a Christian book instead of a screen. Maybe it could be, I really want to grow by learning how to stop, to pray, to wait, and to listen. Maybe that could be the thing we want to grow. To prayerfully, thoughtfully identify, just say, one or two areas of specific growth, something you can do. When you've got those things, write down what difference living out these things in your life will make. How will your life look differently? How will your relationship with the Lord and with others and in his service be different? I've got a, a sheet on the way out to uh, with these things on it to help us. Might be good for growth groups to do this week to think through. What about in terms of don't do? Now, so I've done the do. It's going to help me grow. What about don't do? So identify a particular area of temptation that lures you away from the Lord and into sin. What are you battling with? And think about what that is costing you. What is choosing that sin costing you? When you fail, how does that affect your mood? How does that affect your attitude? How does that affect what you think about yourself? Ah, oh, oh. Be careful, though. Don't let the enemy condemn you. But know this. Just distract me. If you're at that point in life and it's just, oh, I'm hopeless, oh, I can't be a Christian, I'm no good, da, da, da. remember, that's the enemy. The distinction between that and what the Holy Spirit does when he brings conviction of sin is different. The Holy Spirit is going to be quite specific. He'll say, you know, when you said that to your wife in that tone of voice yesterday <laughs> at 12.05 p.m., <laughs> that's what the Spirit does. He wants to bring that thing and then we confess it, repent and receive his forgiveness. The enemy is going to say, are you hopeless? Just this broad brush. Just, just note that difference. What's choosing sin costing you in terms of your relationship with others? And primarily, what is that sin affecting your relationship with God? How is that? So now you've got your, your sort of positive to-do list and you've got your don't-dos and you've got the positive benefits and you've got the costly consequences in your notebook there. And come to the Lord in prayer. Come with a humble heart of repentance and seeking the Lord to help you and enable you. This is essential because choosing God and choosing obedience is primarily a spiritual activity. So we need the Lord's help. And humility and repentance is how we begun the Christian life 
And humility and repentance is how we continue in the Christian life. That's the only way to continue to grow in the Christian life. If you've tried to change in the past and it hasn't worked, not coming to the Lord in humility and repentance to start could be one of the reasons why it hasn't worked. You've still got all the rubbish under the carpet, so to speak. So clear that up first. Offer your entire self to the Lord. We want to be a living sacrifice, according to Romans 12. And invite him to transform you by renewing your mind. Changing how we think. Changing our desires primarily, to desire what the Lord desires and to hate what the Lord hates, that we do not conform to the patterns of this world. Ask the Lord to help you love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love those around you. On your do list, think of some specific small steps that will help you. If it's listening, the thing where you want to grow, it could be learning to ask questions. If it's in the area of marriage, perhaps take your husband and wife's hand and just pray at the dinner table before or after dinner. Or perhaps as you lay down in bed and thank the Lord for the day and thank the Lord for your spouse. If the thing is time with the Lord, a devotion time or whatever, identify that specific time. Is it in the morning? Actually, perhaps lunchtime could be good. If I can leave the office, sit in the car. I don't know. Perhaps the evening might work best for you. When it comes to the don't do's, pray the Lord's Prayer. This day, Lord, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil. And give me wisdom and your strength, Lord, at that time. In doing these things, what you are doing is intentionally inviting the Lord into your choices each day, into that choice equation at the time. There are heaps of other practical things that we can do. As I said, I've got a sheet on the way out uh, with this stuff in it that, that will help us make better choices too. One way is to think ahead, to what they call pre-decide. Uh, pre-decide some things that will help you make the choice easier, the good choice easier, when you get to that point of decision. And there's a few th- ways we can do that. Share your positive choice and what you've written out will be the benefits of that with another person. Hopefully they will encourage you and keep you in that relational accountability. Just how you're going with that. Not being an ogre, but but to to encourage you. If you want want to get organised, write out your to-do list the night before. Know exactly what you're going to do, the first thing you're going to do on that list as you go to bed. Perhaps it could be putting your Bible next to your breakfast bowl and the wheat bix the night before. So you're not sort of go, oh, looking for it in the morning and now I don't have time. It's right there. Have that Christian podcast that you want to listen to on the way to work or while you're gardening or whatever, ready to go. And then you're not scrolling through your phone while you're driving because that's really expensive. I know all about that. There's lots of cameras in Sydney. Did I say that? No, I don't. It's just another warning, okay? (laughs) Yes, I know. I think actually I was handing it to Liz at the time when the camera... I was, I was. 
another thing that that this is just sort of little life hacks. There's nothing really profound about these things. Is to link a new habit with an existing habit. And I think that's the James Clear, the Atomic Habits guy one. As far as I know, I do. Most people I've ever encountered brush their teeth and go to the toilet in the morning or maybe the other way around or however. So one person I was mentoring a little while ago, not in our church, uh, the best thing for him was to put their Bible on the vanity or maybe on the toilet system or however. That's where you are. That's I'm doing this anyway. Okay, there it is. Now I'll go and sit at the table and read it. It's there available. There's lots of pre-decisions that we can make to make choices easier in the moment. We've set ourselves up for success if we're a bit smarter about it. The other side of this is to make bad choices harder. And the most powerful way to do that is also by sharing your struggle with another person. A person you trust. And once you bring that thing where you attempted your struggle into the light of another person, the power of that thing is deflated enormously. The, the, the temptation, the struggle goes out of it. And also, if you've got a good friend that you've shared with, you know, they can, uh, they can ring you up. You can have that relationship, you can check in, you can ring them if you're struggling and that thing will, will really lose its power. Another practical thing we can do to set up to help us choose better is to use alarms, apps, software that, that is either going to limit our screen time or it can uh, you know, eliminate particular categories when we're surfing the, the internet, or perhaps the alarm can just get us moving. Another thing is to pre-decide, and this is a really good one, pre-decide what you'll do when that temptation comes, because it will. So what are you going to do? Well, know what you're going to do beforehand. So, for example, you could... Uh, Leave the room where you're at and just go and chat to someone else in the household, perhaps. Make a cup of coffee. Call that friend. You say, oh, I'm just, it's just coming again now, mate. Just pray for me, would you? Look at your notebook where you've written the good consequences and the bad consequences out. Or in that moment, do, do a one-minute cost-benefit analysis. And if all else fails, take a cold shower. The Christian most prepared to conquer temptation is the one who prays and plans against it. So there are many things we can do to help us choose the Lord and in doing so, we are choosing life. And even more than that, we are positioning ourselves then to be in that place where the Lord can bless us. There's a lot at stake. And when we reflect on Israel, we see how much they lost for choosing poorly. They lost their love of the Lord, which meant they gave way to the power of temptations and the cultures around them. They ignored, and in fact they did for a period of time, lost the gift of the law that the Lord gave them. So their society grew in inequality and injustice. And this led to moral weakness. And that caused economic and it caused national weakness, being unable to defend themselves. They lost their strength. And because of that, they lost their land. 
they also lost their unique role of representing God to the world. They walked away from their special covenant relationship with God and preferred disobedience so the Lord could not bless them. Let their incalculable loss because of bad choices teach us, encourage us to choose well. This day, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. I think we've got the next slide. So that you and your children may live, that you may love the Lord your God, Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge and encouragement that it is. Lord, we ask for your help to choose. It's a spiritual battle we face. We need your spirit to help us win it. We ask, Lord, that we'll be sensitive to you and obedient to the leading of your spirit, that we might glorify, honour and serve you as you enable us to. In your name, amen.